All right, 8.30 was a little more alive than you, which I'm kind of disappointed about. So let's do that again. How's everybody doing today? Are we ready to be in the house of the Lord? All right, that's better. Well, hey, welcome to Grace Point West. We're so excited to get to worship with you today. My name is Pastor Kurt. I'm the adults pastor here. Uh, and I'm just excited to bring this word for you this morning. I want to welcome our online guests watching as well, because uh, they're part of this family, right? Amen? Yeah. Um, and so we've been in this series called Tried and Tested over the last couple of weeks, where we're examining different biblical figures and how they have walked through these different trials, these different testing of their faith, and how God has overcome all of these things in their life and how what their life look like coming out on the other side. And it's just an incredible series. I love the way that God is showing up and how we get to see God show up in big ways. Um, it's pretty awesome because I think we can relate to that, right? I think we can relate to this trial and testing, right? Is that just me? No, no, I don't think so. I think we, we live in a, a season of trial and testing. I mean, the gas pump every time I go to fill up is a different trial. It makes me wonder, you know, should I be walking to work? Is this like horse and buggy time? What's going on here? Um, maybe the, Am- the Amish always knew, didn't they? They've always known. They've got it right the whole time. But we live in series of trials and tribulations, testings, these moments of waiting in our faith where we're challenged at different times. And these times where some of these challenges seem insurmountable, right? Right? Do you have, ever feel that where, man, I'm just facing this, this mountain of a thing in my life, and I don't know how I'm going to overcome this. I don't know how I'm going to get past this. I don't know what's next. And it's amazing because we often experience this, and I, I've experienced this too. And so there's a moment about five years ago in 2017 where I was driving home from work one night. And I was in the left-hand lane, as I like to be, because that's the, that's the fast lane, right? That's the, pass, the passing lane, I should say. Um, but I'm in the left-hand lane, stop traffic, and I'm sitting there talking to my wife on the phone. And I look in my rearview mirror, because I'm always watching what's going on, and I see behind me this tractor trailer just barreling down the highway. I mean, this guy is cruising. And I'm like, man, I don't know if that guy's going to have enough time to stop. And so I'm keep, I keep watching him, and I'm like, I don't even think he's trying to stop. Right, and so I go to get into the the shoulder to get out of his way, and the next thing I know, bam, I get smacked, and I wake up, and I'm in my car still, but I backed, rolled back into this ditch, and went to the hospital that night, and, and I think we have some pictures of of the car if you want to throw that up there. So I was, yeah, so a Honda Civic. I will say this. That car took that hit like a champ. Look at that thing, man. Um, But no, that was in a Honda Civic, and this was a tractor trailer. It hit me going about 65 miles an hour. Um, And that's after leaving 50 yards of skid mark on the highway. So don't know what he was doing, but he was going very fast. Um, And so he hit me, and I went to the hospital that night. uh, Hit my head really hard. I think we got a picture of that, too. And so it looks just like a little scrape, right? But actually, like, my head is swollen on top, and I... I now currently have like this permanent like divot in my head where it's soft and then like my skulls moved all around. It's all weird stuff. Anyways, so that night I go to the hospital and over the the next you know months and years really uh, I start to see changes. You know I, I have bad neck pain. Right, I have herniated discs in my back and in my neck. Uh, I had shoulder surgery as well to fix you know my shoulder. Um, but one of the things that I began to notice most was personality change. And so I noticed that I just get angry all the time or I'd be sad. I'd have to pull over on the side of the road and I just cry. And I'm like, what are you, it was weird. It was like out of body experience almost. Cause I'm like, what are you do? Why are you crying? Like, what are you doing, man? Or like, I'd be angry. I'm like, why did that make you so mad? That's not that big of a deal. Like it's okay, but I couldn't control it. And I began to watch myself change slowly over these years. And it was absolutely terrifying and I began to notice other changes where I couldn't comprehend things. I, I'd walk into a meeting and walk right back out and be like, what was that even about? I mean, I'm sure we all experienced that on some occasion, right? But, but especially if it's boring. But this was, this was an, a normal occurrence for me. This was all the time, regardless of sleep or caffeine or how interesting it was. I would forget. And there was a time where I was sitting and talking to one of my employees at the, at the time, and I heard him speaking English, but my brain couldn't take his words and put meaning to them. So it's almost as if he was speaking, you know, he was in the bilingual service and he was speaking Spanish and I didn't know what he was talking about, right? Uh, it, was, it was that level where it was, he was speaking a different language almost, but he was speaking English. 
And I, so I started to notice these changes and I went to go see a neurologist and an endocrinologist about them and found out that my pituitary gland, because I hit my head so hard on the roof of the car that I had a traumatic brain injury, my pituitary gland stopped functioning almost. Um, it was at a very low level of functioning. And so um, they began to tell me this, this is probably going to be a forever thing, that you're going to be like this and you're probably going to slowly degrade over time. And I'll tell you, church, that was scary. It's absolutely terrifying because it's one thing to have a broken arm and to go get surgery. It's one thing to, you know, to try to fix things or to have it heal over time. It's another thing to feel like you're losing yourself and you have zero control over it. And so I had to take a, a, a shot every day um, in my leg to introduce these hormones back in my body to regulate myself. Um, but it was scary because it, it felt like I was slipping away. And I remember that moment those years where it just seemed like silence, where it seemed like nothing was happening, where I felt like God isn't here. Does he even care about me? Why would this happen to me? Are you, are you moving? Are you speaking? What are you doing? And it was just silence for years. And I think we can relate to that, right? I think we've all had moments where we've been questioning and asking and wrestling with God and he feels silent or he feels distant in our lives. And so, but I can stand here now five years later and tell you that God was moving, that God was speaking to me, that God was doing a mighty work in my heart to prepare me ultimately to be one of your pastors down here. But waiting sucks, doesn't it? I mean, how many of us love to wait? How many of us are like, man, you know what? DMV, my favorite place. That's my jam right there. Or I love sitting in traffic. You know, when I get on 1604, I just can't wait to just sit here for three and a half hours, it feels like, while people are doing nothing on the road. Um, just get to a red light, right? And we're like, thank you, God, for this red light. I didn't want to get anywhere anytime soon, right? Apparently, I have some PTSD with driving. Um, that's a sensitive subject for me. But, um, but we are. We're, we're a culture of immediate, right? We want instant gratification. We post something on Facebook or Instagram or whatever the kids are using these days, right? And we want, to, we want the like. We want, we want affirmation right then and there. We, we need it. We need the, you know, the endorphin release. We need all that stuff right now. That's why Amazon is such a big company, is because immediate gratification, right? I can press a button, and two days later, it shows up on my doorstep, right? That's a pretty cool thing. And even so, maybe you're like me, but I'll even order a cruddier version of something because it's got overnight shipping, where I can get it 4 a.m. to 8 a.m., right? Versus waiting two days and getting a better version of it, right? Even though I don't need it for two weeks, but I want it now. But we are a culture of instant gratification where we need it and we need it now. And we hate waiting. And waiting on God is hard too. But it's often in these moments of waiting that we see where God is doing the biggest work in our hearts. The biggest work in our spirit is where he's instilling in us discipline. He's instilling in us patience. These are good, godly characteristics, right? Steadfastness. He's building our character, our trust, and our faith in him even. And we often want to reach the goal without the work, right? How many of us just want the six-pack abs without the six months of dieting and exercise, right? If I, if I could just get it, get the beach body, that'd be great. No, but we don't want to put in the work, right? We don't want to wait for those sort of things. Amen, Amen sister. <laughs> Me too. And see, we see this idea of waiting all through the scriptures where people are waiting on the Lord where they're waiting for God to do something, where they're waiting for God to show up. We see this all through the New Testament. It's the story of the Israelites, right? They're waiting for their king. They're waiting for their healer. They're waiting for this and this and this and God to move and show up in these powerful ways. But today we're going to be focusing on 1 Kings chapter 17, and this is the story of Elijah. So I want to give you some background before we just jump into the passage. At this time, there's a lot of kings in Israel, right? They've seen good kings, they've seen bad kings, and right now they have a very bad king, and he's married to a very bad queen named Jezebel. And Jezebel, 
she is really the the ruler of this relationship that we're going to see later on. You know, Ahab's the king, right? But he's like the queen of England. He doesn't really have any real power. You know, it's it's really Jezebel who pulls, who's wearing the pants. She's the one pulling the strings. And this woman is the epitome of evil, guys. I mean, she makes Amber Heard look like Mary Poppins. I mean, this lady <laughs> is downright absolutely evil. She's an evil lady. And under Ahab and Jezebel, Israel has turned their backs on the way of the Lord. They've turned their backs on Yahweh. They've turned their backs on the God that has led them out of Egypt and began to worship a God named Baal who was Jezebel's God. So Jezebel introduces this pagan God, this false worship. And what we find is that this, this God has specific characteristics, right? So we see all of these gods, you know, you have like the water God and the sky God and the thunder God. Well, God, this God, Baal, is the God of fertility and rain. And so his whole shtick is that, you know, he makes you have good crops. And, you know, if you worship him, he'll send rain upon the land in order to produce, right? And so they begin to worship this God. And really what we find out is that Baal is just another name for Satan. This is a false God who wants to usurp the God of the Bible and take his place on his throne, but he's a imposter, but he's masquerading as himself as a God and they begin to worship this God. And so what happens is God is not satisfied with this as he's not, he's a jealous God. And so he sends a prophet named Elijah to Ahab in order to confront this problem of pagan worship. And that's where we pick up the story today. So open your Bibles to first Kings chapter 17. And it says this now, Elijah, who is from Tishbe in Gilead told King Ahab, as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, the God I serve, there will be no dew or rain during the next few years until I give the word. Then the Lord said to Elijah, Go to the east and hide by Kareth Brook, near where enters the Jordan River. Drink from the brook and eat what the ravens bring you, for I have commanded them to bring you food. So Elijah did as the Lord told him. And camp beside the Kareth Brook, east of the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat each morning and evening, and he drank from the brook. But after a while, the brook dried up, for there is no rainfall in the land. And so here's Elijah confronting Ahab. So he goes to the king and he says, look, you have this God that you're worshiping and that you've convinced the entire nation of Israel to worship too. This God that brings the rain, right? Well, I'm going to tell you that my God, who I serve, the one true God who really controls the rain, is going to make it not rain until I say so. And the very next thing is he gets out of town because now all of a sudden he's a wanted man, right? We don't like our buttons pushed. We don't like people coming up to our face and saying, you're wrong, right? I mean, we have a whole political system of that. It seems like everybody pointing fingers, right? And so Elijah goes up to Ahab and he's like, look, you're worshiping a false God. My God is a real God. And now I'm going to prove it to you. It's not going to rain. So he flees and he runs and he goes to this place called Kareth. And while he's here... He sees that this is a moment where God is challenging this God, Baal. He's challenging him to a contest. And the brook uh, that he goes to is interesting, too. It's called Kareth. And Elijah waits there until God tells him to go somewhere else. Now, we don't know exactly how long Elijah was here. Some people think it's about six months to two years. And so not, a, not like a weekend excursion, right? This is an extended stay. Um, this is Airbnb in it at this place for a long time. And so he's here at the brook, and Elijah is just commanded to wait. He just says, wait, and just be fed. Be fed by ravens, and, and they'll bring meat and, and, and bread, and there's going to be water there for you as well. And so what God is doing is God is actually what we're going to see in the story is he's working in the heart of Elijah. And he's not only working in the heart of Elijah, but he's also working in the heart of Israel. And he's working in the heart of the, the entire nation. He's setting the stage for what is going to happen at Mount Carmel that we're going to see here in a little bit. But while he's, in the way, while he's at the brook, God is doing three things really in Elijah's heart that I want to take a look at this morning. Because I believe firmly that when we are in our season of waiting as well, when we're sitting beside a brook and just allowing God to just be with us, these are the things that God does for us as well. Now, in the season where we're questioning, in the season where we're wrestling, in the season where we're unsure of what's next, 
These are the things that God will do in our heart when we're obedient to listen to him. And that's the important thing. You see, Elijah, God called him to this brook and Elijah obeyed and went. And so while in the brook, God does these three things. The first thing that he does is that God protects Elijah. He protects Elijah. He calls him to this brook because at this time, they begin looking for Elijah. They don't like being confronted. They don't like being challenged. They don't like the fact that it's also not raining. So not only are they challenged, but Elijah's kind of being proven to be, you know, the right one, right? And so they start to look for Elijah. They start to look for the prophets of God and they start to kill them. And so what God does is immediately he calls Elijah to this brook called Kareth and Kareth or Sharith, you know, depending on what translation you're reading, means to be cut off or separated. So as the east of the Jordan River, the Jordan River is the boundary of Israel. So God is calling him to a place to be cut off, to be separated from his nation in order to be protected. And sometimes we feel like that, don't we? God, why are you calling me to this place? Why are you calling me to this or to do this, right? This seems to be weird. But what God is doing is he's protecting Elijah from Ahab and Jezebel. By calling him to be separated. So he goes to this land east of the Jordan, which is outside of their boundary, and a brook uh, at this brook called Kareth. And during this time of separation, as Jezebel's looking for him, Elijah is experiencing God's protection. And the God that, that protected Elijah is the same God that protects us as well. And sometimes we, we're even unaware of what God is doing in order to protect us. I mean, I look at my car accident, right? The fact that I'm standing here today, God protected me. In that moment. And likewise, I'm here to tell you that God is protecting you as well. And God says that he's our great protector. In the scriptures, it says in Joshua 1, 9, this is my command. Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. That he's with us, right? He'll protect us. Don't, you don't have to fear for things. God is your protector. Psalm 20, verse 1, in times of trouble, may the Lord answer your cry. May the name of the God of Jacob keep you safe from all harm. And in all of the rest of the Psalms, we see this idea of God being our refuge, that God being our shelter, God being our protector. And, and just as a shelter or a house protects us from storms, right, and the rains and the things that come and the incredible heat this past week, right, Likewise, God is our protector, shielding us from things as well. And he's our refuge. And so we're going to believe what God says. If he says he's our refuge, he is. And we can believe that. The second thing that God does here for Elijah is that he provides for Elijah. And we see he does this through the ravens. So every day, Elijah gets two meals. So not even one. He gets two. In the morning and the evening, the ravens bring him food. They bring him meat and they bring him bread. And the interesting thing is that God chooses a raven. And in the Bible, a raven is, is predict, you know, portrayed as this nasty, kind of dirty bird. Um, it's unclean by the ceremonial law of, of the Jews. And so God sends this nasty, dirty bird to Elijah to bring him food. And I don't know, maybe Elijah's like, I probably need to cook that before I eat that. I'm mean, touching that stuff, right? Um, but they, they were a dirty bird. Not only that, but they're actually unreliable too that we see in the scripture when Noah sends out the birds after the ark lands right or after the the rain stop and he's in the ark he sends out two birds he sends out a raven first and the raven just kind of circles back around and comes back in and he doesn't bring anything with him he fails his mission and then we see that God or a, a Noah sends a dove and the dove goes out and it brings a branch back and then it goes back out again and then it doesn't come back because we know there's dry land now and so this idea that God would send Noah a raven, an unreliable, unclean bird to feed him, I think is God telling him that, look, this isn't just a bird bringing you food. This is me providing for you. Because if it was a reliable bird or if it was something that we could like work out in our own minds, like logically, okay, that makes sense. I know why that bird's probably bringing them food because they, you know, fly this way. Or it's none of that stuff. Like this is God's provision for Elijah. And the interesting thing is in the New Testament, we see God, Jesus, used the same verbiage when talking about his care for us. And I believe this is Jesus hearkening back to this moment where he provided for Elijah in the brook and is saying, I will likewise provide for you too. Look what it says in Luke 12. Look, the ravens, they don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, 
for God feeds them and you are more valuable to him than any birds. And this is a beautiful picture, beautiful reminder of God's provision. Not only did God provide enough food for Elijah, he provided enough food for even the ravens. Otherwise they may have eaten his food, right? But God is our provider and he's providing for Elijah daily. The third thing that God is doing in Elijah's heart is that he is preparing Elijah for what is next. Now we know the story. We can see the beginning for the end, but Elijah can't, and he can't even maybe understand why God is doing some of the things he's doing, but he sees that God is protecting him and he sees that God is providing for him daily. And so Elijah, through those two things, he's being prepared for what is next. And after the brook dries up, God calls Elijah to go to this town to meet this widow. And we're going to pick up the story there. Then the Lord said to Elijah, go and live in the village of Zarephath near the city of Sidon. I have instructed a widow there to feed you. So he went to Zarephath. As he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw a widow gathering sticks and he asked her, would you please bring me a little water and a cup? And again, guys, middle of the drought, right? His brook has dried up. And then he goes to this town. And he finds this widow and he's like, Hey, bring me a cup of water. But she said, I swear by the Lord your God, um, or I'm sorry, but please bring me some water in a cup. And as she was going to get it, he called her and said, bring me a bite of bread too. But she said, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house. And I have a handful of flour left and a jar of cooking oil in the bottom of a jug. I was just gathering a few sticks to go cook this last meal. And then my son and I would die. So Elijah not only asked for a cup of water in the middle of the drought, but then he's like, also, on your way back, could you bring me some bread, right? It's kind of like, hey, could you get me a sandwich kind of thing? And so I just find that really funny that he's also not only saying bring me water, but also bring me food, something that they probably don't have a lot of because it hasn't rained, which means their crops haven't grown. So Elijah is just asking her for things that he probably knows that she doesn't really have. But Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go ahead and do just as you said. But make a little bread for me first. Then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. There will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. So she did as Elijah said, and she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. There is always enough flour and olive oil left in the containers, just as the Lord had promised through Elijah. And how can Elijah do this? How can he go to this woman who has nothing, this widow? And when she tells him, look, I have enough for me and my son to eat our last meal. And then we're going to die because we have nothing because of this drought. Because your God sent this drought, we have nothing. And so now you, you a prophet of this God, are going to come and ask for me for things? I don't have anything. I don't have water, I don't have food except for what my son and I are going to eat and then die. This is the moment of her desperation. And Elijah's response is this. The Lord will provide. Amen. Amen. Why do I know the Lord will provide? Because I've watched him do it day in and day out. He has brought ravens to me every day to bring me bread and meat. He has brought water to the brook every day. God is my provider, my sustainer. He is the reason that I have anything in church that is us. The reason we have anything in our life is because God is a good provider. And what he's saying here to this widow is that God will show up in your life as well. I know it because I've seen it. And what happens? God does exactly what he says he's going to do. And it's through the obedience of Elijah that allows for this to happen. The fact that Elijah went to Ahab in the first place, the fact that Elijah went to the brook when he was told to, the fact that Elijah got up when he was told to and went to this widow in his, his obedience to the word of God and what God is calling him to do that is allowing for these sort of things to happen in the widow's life. And it is not only his obedience, but her obedience to say yes to him. Say, okay, you know what? I will serve the Lord. I will do that even though I don't understand it, even though I don't get it, even though what seems to be in front of me, right, is death and certain death. I'm still going to say yes to what God has in store and when we say yes to what the Lord says, say yes to, he shows up and he provides and he protects. And he's doing that for her right now. And it's Elijah's obedience and his faith in the Lord that is allowing for these things to happen. That is seeing God show up in these mighty ways. Because directly after this, 
the widow's son becomes sick and dies. And she even says to Elijah, is that why you're here to bring up my past sins? Are you here to remind me of my sin and then to take my son and kill him? Is that why you're here? You've taken everything else. And again, how easily we forget. I mean, she sees the jars, right? But now again, she's back at it. Now I've forgotten again. And we're going to see that with Elijah too, that I've forgotten. I've watched God show up and now I have forgotten again. Well, what happens? God is good and he shows up. And Elijah carries the boy up to his room, dead, lays him on his bed and prays over him. And he comes back to life. And Elijah gets to experience the first resurrection in the scriptures. It's because he had faith that God could do it. This is easy for God. Of course he can do this. Of course he can create out of nothing. Of course he can take dead things and bring them back to life. That's our story, right? Is resurrection. And immediately after this, he calls Elijah then to go confront Ahab again. And now it's time. Now it's time to take down this God Baal. And so what happens is Elijah goes to Ahab and he says, gather the whole nation. Get everybody together. We're going to Mount Carmel. Gather your 450 prophets and meet me there. So Ahab gathers all the nation of Israel, gathers his prophets, and they go to Mount Carmel. And here's where God is going to set the stage to turn the entire nation back to himself. And so what happens is Elijah says, go ahead and and what we're going to do is you're going to build an altar. I'm going to build an altar. You get a calf. I get a calf or a bull. And I'll even let you pick which bull you want, right? So you can't say that you got the bad one, right? You get to pick. You get to set up your altar first. You get all of the good stuff. Go ahead and put it all together, right? So they put it all together and they begin to pray to Baal. And they're worshiping Baal. They're dancing around. They're singing. And it says that it goes on into the afternoon. All day long that they're doing these things. They start to cut themselves in order to worship him. And Elijah, and I love Elijah. He's got such a good sense of humor. He goes to them and he says, well, guys, I mean... It was getting kind of late. Where's your God at? Like, maybe he's on vacation. And then what he says to him next is hilarious. He says, well, maybe he's going to the bathroom. Do you think that? Maybe he's got, maybe he's got caught up at the toilet, you know, he's in there. Maybe, maybe he brought his phone with him like a dad does, right? You know, so he's going to be in there for a while. It's funny that he uses toilet humor here. It's in the Bible, guys. I'm telling you, years of student ministry vindicated right here in this passage. (laughs) Toilet humor is a good thing. It's biblical. But Elijah, Elijah begins to mock them, right? And then after a while, they cease, and Elijah, it's his turn. So he builds the altar. He takes 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel. So there's no mistake about who this God is, right? He builds the altar of God. He places the stones around him, and then he commands people to go get four jars of water. And they fill up the jars of water, and they dump water on wood. And I don't know if you know anything about, like, fires, but... Water and fire don't mix well. So you don't want to put water on wood that you're going to light on fire, right? And this is God stacking the deck against himself because he wants everyone to know that this isn't a circumstance. This is a miracle. This is a move of God. And there will be no doubt left in anyone's mind that this is the true God of Israel. And so Elijah takes that and he, and he does it three times. So 12 jugs of water are poured to this where this, this little creek is running around the altar. And then Elijah begins to pray. And he prays for God to reveal himself, to make his name known in the nation of Israel so that the nation will turn back to him. And immediately fire falls down from heaven and it consumes the altar. Not only the altar, it consumes everything, the stones, the water, even the dust around it. It consumes everything. And instantly the entire nation of Israel turns back to the God of Israel and says, yes, Yahweh is Lord. Baal is not. And in an instant, the nation is restored back to the Lord again. And these are some incredible miracles that Elijah gets to see. And I believe it is his time in the brook that prepared him to see it. Because what God was doing when he provided for him, when he protected for him, he prepared Elijah to see these sort of things because it took faith to do it. And there's this quote by Ben Patterson that I think is so crucial for us to remember. It says, what God is doing in us while we wait is at least as important as what we think we're waiting for. 
Say that again. What God is doing in us while we wait is at least as important as what we're waiting for. And I would even argue sometimes it's more important than what we're actually waiting for. Because this is where God begins to increase our faith. It's where God begins to move in our hearts and to make himself known to us. He spent years watching God protect him from Jezebel and provide food. His faith had grown and he knew that God was going to show up. He didn't have a doubt. Of course, God's going to show up. I've seen him do it for years. My time at the brook. And he knew all of these things were easy for the Lord to do. And I think that's one thing that we need to remember. Fire from heaven is easy for God. Resurrection is easy for God. This is a God who spoke and things became. Out of nothing, God created everything by his word. So these things, it's easy. And I'm here to tell you that the things in your life too are easy for God to do. It's, he's not challenged by it. It's easy for him to do. Amen. And it was his faith that changed everything. His faith in God, his faith that he believed that God would show up because God had in the quiet and in the stillness and the, the season of wrestling and questioning, God showed up and that prepared him to see what he saw now through faith. And we see that faith changes things. It affects things in our lives and, and the scriptures say so. In Hebrews Chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Hebrews 11, 11, By faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was able to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made that promise. And again, it didn't make sense. She's, she's old. She's past childbearing age. But God had promised her that you will have a child. And she had faith in him who is faithful. And she had a child because of her faith and because of God's faithfulness. Matthew chapter 17, he replied, because you have so little faith, truly I tell you, if you had faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. This is, these are the words of Jesus. And when he's referring to moving mountains, he's not guys talking about the Texas hill country. Those are hills. I, I come down here and people are like, oh, look at our mountains. I'm like, those are mountains, guys. Those are, those are hills. Those are like dirt mountains, okay? What Jesus, I believe, is referring to here is the Rocky Mountains, Mount Everest, right? He's referring to these 14ers, these massive mountains of earth protruding out of, the, out of the ground. This is what he's referring to. And he's saying, if you have faith as little as a mustard seed, this tiny little seed, you can move that thing. And in our life, we can do the same. Mark 10, 52, Jesus said to him, go, your faith has healed you. Instantly, the man could see, and he followed Jesus down the road. Mark 5, 34, and he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. See, faith changes things. Faith has an effect on things in our life, and it's through God providing and protecting that we can see our faith increased. And that we can trust in the Lord to do what he is faithful to do. And so in the moments of silence, we can absolutely see God provide and protect for us. These are moments of preparation for what's next. God is building your faith. And he is showing you that he is good and that he loves you. And that he desires to show up in your life. And the last part of this chapter in Elijah's life... Um, is a familiar one, I think, for a lot of us. And we hinted at it a little earlier. See, Elijah had seen God protect. He'd seen God provide. And he'd watched God prepare him in his season of waiting by the brook. Elijah sees incredible miracles, right? I mean, how many of us would like to be there at Mount Carmel to watch that happen, right? How many of us would like, like to have been at the Red Sea, how many of us would like to see these massive movements and displays of God's power to see a boy come back to life, to see bread just constantly show up in a jar? I mean, those would be some incredible things to see, right? So he's witnessing historic events right before his eyes. And then he prays for rain and rain comes, guys. God kept his word. He was faithful. But then all of a sudden, Jezebel hears about what's happening. And she's furious, and she seeks to kill Elijah. So Elijah runs. He gets out of town. And it says in 1 Kings 19, Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. 
think we know who wears the pants in this relationship, right? Ahab said, now Jezebel, ugh, it wasn't me, right? It was Elijah. It was, it, it was this guy, right? Be mad at him. I'm just the messenger. So he comes and he tells Jezebel everything that, that he did. And so Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make you your life like that of one of them. And what she's referring to is Elijah wound up killing all the prophets of Baal, all 450 of them. They killed them all. So she's saying, if I don't make your life like their life, which is dead, then may the gods treat me severely. And so it says Elijah was afraid and he ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. And it's often in these wilderness moments that we find God too. That we see God show up. It's in the times of uncertainty, the times of fear, the times of trembling, the times of questioning and wrestling. And that's where Elijah is. He's in the wilderness. And he came to a broom brush and sat down under it and prayed that he might die had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he laid down under the bush and fell asleep. While running away, he complains to God and he asks the Lord to take his life. He's so fearful and just wants to be done. I mean, hear that again. After seeing all these incredible things, these movements of God, now all of a sudden Elijah is fearful because of this lady, Jezebel. A created being causing him so much fear that he's not trusting in the one that made her that an immortal per or a mortal person causing him to distrust the immortal being and how often is that our life too right I mean, we see all these amazing things. We see God show up in our life. We see him heal our marriage or heal our family, or we see him provide out of nowhere. We see these incredible movements of God with the fact that we are alive today. Some of us are even testimonies to God's power. And how quickly are we to even forget that? And to become fearful and scared that God's not going to do it again, that he's not going to show up, that he's not going to provide. And after God protected him for years by the brook, he's now scared and he wants to die. And it's the same story of the Israelites, right? They fled Egypt and God, all these plagues, right? And then they got to the Red Sea and God parted the sea. And then God sent manna from heaven and then God did this and God did this. And all of a sudden, Moses disappears for a little bit and they start worshiping a golden calf. And I think Elijah recognizes it here too. And he's like, I'm just like my ancestors who did the same thing, who watched you show up. And then they lost faith. So God, just take my life. I'm done. I'm burnt out. I just want to die. And this is when the enemy begins to show up. This is when he shows up in our life and he begins to tell us things that you're not worthy. You're not good enough. You can never earn that. You can never be this. God doesn't love you. How could he love you when you're like this? You can't do that. He begins to accuse because the Bible tells us that he stands before the throne of God, accusing the brethren day and night that he is the accuser. And he's accusing you of these things as well. But what is God's response to Elijah? All at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there was a head and there by his head was some bread baked over some hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then he laid down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, strengthened by that food. He traveled for 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. So here is God, who when we mess up church, we often kind of wince, right? Like we're just, we're just waiting for God to drop the hammer. We're just waiting for him to do something in our lives to, to punish us. Yep, we did it. We deserve the punishment. And Elijah, I've seen you show up. And I've lost faith. So just take my life. Just take it away. I'm done. But God doesn't drop the, the hammer on Elijah. But instead, he gives Elijah the perfect toddler afternoon, right? A nap and a snack. Because often we act like toddlers, right? And God knows what we need. And he knew that that's what Elijah needed. He knows that we become a little hangry at times. And that sleep makes things better, right? I mean, how many of us have gone to bed really mad about something, wake up and we're like, ah, oh, it's not that big of a deal anymore, right? 
Sleep makes us feel better. And God knew that that's exactly what Elijah needed. He needed to rest. He needed a little bit of food. See, when the enemy wants to contem- condemn and discourage us in this life, God wants to pick us back up again. God wants to dust us off. He wants to restore us. And man, can we celebrate God's good love for us this morning? God is a great provider that God does indeed love us. <clears throat> and so when Elijah goes to Mount Horeb, which is actually another name for Mount Sinai, this is the same mountain, same place where, Eli- where Moses got the Ten Commandments. So there's all these parallels to the Exodus story here. But Elijah goes to this mountain, Sinai or Horeb, and here he goes into this cave to sleep. And this is where he experiences the Lord. And it says, but the Lord said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah replied, I've zealously served the Lord God Almighty. I've been there for you every step of the way. I've done all the things you've asked. I've been obedient. I've been zealous for you, God. But the people of Israel, all of them out there, they broke your covenant. They're the ones that did it. And then they killed all of your, your prophets. And I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. So God says to him, go out and stand before me on the mountain. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by. And a mighty windstorm hit the mountain with such terrible blast that the rocks were thrown loose. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord, again, was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And the voice said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And I read the story and I'm surprised at how God talks to Elijah here. Because you think what Elijah would need is for God to show up and remind him of his power, right? He says, what are you doing here, Elijah? After all that I've done, after all that I've provided, after all that you have witnessed, what are you doing here? Have you forgotten? Do I, need to, do I need to send another windstorm and shake the mountain to an earthquake? How about fire again? That seemed to work the last time. Let's do that again. But it says that God wasn't in any of that stuff. You think that God would want to remind Elijah that you're running from this lady. You're fearful of this lady. And I'm the one that did all these things. I need to remind you of my power. I can take her out like that. I need to remind you of who I am, right? But that's not what God does, no. Instead, what God does is he comes to him as a gentle whisper. And why does God do this? I think it's because he's reminding Elijah of his time at the brook. Elijah, don't you remember when I protected you from her? Don't you remember when I showed up and I gave you food twice a day? Don't you remember when I silently prepared you for what was next to see all of those things? See, Elijah needed to be reminded of his time in the brook. He needed to be reminded of God's provision for him. Just not his power, right? But that God cared for him. Elijah, I care for you. I love you. I'm just not a powerful being. I'm an intimate God who cares about you. And yes, can also do all of those things too. And it's interesting that it says that he heard the whisper and he immediately went out. And I think that's because he recognized the whisper. He recognized it from his time at the brook. And that's the importance of knowing the voice of God, church. That's why it's important to be able to discern God's voice and to know it. And we do that by spending time in his word and spending time with him, knowing his voice and knowing his heart. And God is reminding Elijah that before all these massive displays of power, he was faithful. And that he cared for Elijah and that he loves Elijah. And he's saying, remember my faithfulness, my goodness, my provision, my love for you. And how often do we need to be reminded of that too? That God isn't just a God of power, but he's a God of love. He's a God of provision. We remember the mountaintop experiences. Those are easy, right? Those are the big moments that we saw God show up. But what about the seasons of waiting where we simply just watched God provide quietly and protected us quietly? It's these times that, hold, that we should hold on to that make the moments that we see fire fall from heaven even more meaningful. Because God, who can do that, who can call fire down from heaven, cares enough about me to provide for me daily. Cares enough about my daily need that he's willing to show up in those moments too. 
And it's easy to look at the story and say, yeah, Kurt, I get it. Okay. But Elijah was a prophet and I'm not a prophet. I'm just a normal dude or normal lady sitting here in this room. I'm, I'm not that right. I haven't followed God for that long. I don't know the Bible that well. I don't, don't have all of these things. Elijah is special. He's unique. And that's why God showed up and did all these things. But that's just not true. Because James chapter 5 says this, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed fervently that it would not rain. And for, six year, or for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. See, Elijah is a man like us. He has a nature like us that any one of us in this room can watch God show up in the exact same way that he showed up in Elijah's life. That God cares for you just as much as he has cared for Elijah. And how he provided and protected Elijah, he will provide and protect for you as well. See, the story isn't actually about Elijah, but it's about God. And it's about God showing the entire nation his faithfulness. And even when you don't see it, and even when you don't feel it, God is working, right? We sing that song, Waymaker, here. And that beautiful, beautiful verse of, man, even when you don't see it, even when you don't feel it, God is still working. He's still moving. He's still active. He's not asleep. He's not going to the bathroom. He's not on vacation. He is active and he is present in your life right now. And you don't have to feel it in order for God to be there because proximity isn't a God issue. It's an us issue. God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. It says this, Deuteronomy 31, be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them. Don't fear the things of this life. Don't fear the armies. Don't fear all of the things that come against you. Do not fear them for it is the Lord, your God who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. It says again in the NASB version that be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or tremble at them for the Lord, your God is the one, the one who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Church, do you believe that he will not fail you nor forsake you? Some of us feel we live our lives. We experience our faith like God is just going to fail us again. Oh, there it is. See, I knew it. I called it. We live life. We have no faith that God's going to show up and do powerful things. We believe in God, but we deny his power. Instead, we need to be believing in his power to show up that because he cares for us and he demonstrated this love for us by this, that while we were still sinners, while we're still broken and wretched people, Christ died for you and me. That's how much God loves you and me. And of course, he's going to provide. Of course, he's going to show up. Of course, he's going to display his power so that he may be glorified in our lives so that we may look at this time and say it was nothing else but God showing up and thank God he did. And God wants us to believe this so much that he repeats himself later on in the book of Joshua. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. With you wherever you go. Not in the small things, not in the big things, not just down 1604. Everywhere that you go, God is with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And so I want to close with this. Because I want you to write this down. This is so important and vital. So if you have a pen and paper, if you got a phone, because this cert sums up the entire morning in this statement. When you're fleeing from your Jezebels, remember your moments at the brook. When you're fleeing from the Jezebels of your life, when you are fearful, when you're overwhelmed, when you feel like you don't have the answers, when you feel like you just want to give up like Elijah did. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Take my life. I'm over this thing. When you experience those moments of fleeing from Jezebels and they will come church, the Bible promises us persecution. It promises that these hardships will come in our lives. But what God will do is he will show up and walk with us through these moments. And it's the times that we're in the brook. It's the times where we're waiting. It's the time where we're wrestling with God. And we're trying to figure out who he is and what he's doing when we're asking him, God, where are you? And he's quietly providing for us. And he's showing up and being faithful. And we can look back on that time later on and say, God is faithful. I've seen him show up in these moments. I've seen him provide for me. I've seen him protect me. I've seen him demonstrate his love for me. And so the Jezebels, you have no power. You can't control me. I'm not fearful of you because I got a God who is bigger. I got a God who is more loving, who can display these incredible things of power. Why? Because he loves me. He loves me. And so in my time of waiting, when I thought I was lost, when I thought I didn't know who I was going to be anymore, 
I didn't think that I was going to be able to be a pastor. I didn't think I was going to be able to lead or, or to speak publicly or anything because of what was going on in my brain. And on my own, I probably would have been right. But God showed up. And in the moments that I was wrestling, in the moments where I didn't even know how to ask him for things, God was there providing for me. Guys, he protected me in that car because you could ask any one of those EMTs. You could ask any one of the doctors that saw me and looked at those pictures and said, I've never watched somebody walk away from that. Either that truck should have crushed you into the car in front of you or it should have just ran right over top of you. You should be dead. And then to watch God provide for my family when I couldn't. When he showed up and he was there for us every day, daily providing for us, showing us his love and his steadfastness and his faithfulness for us. And he showed me that if I'm still standing here today, then there is a purpose for my life. That I walked away from that car accident because I have purpose and I have meaning. And I want to let you know that you have that same purpose and meaning. That if you are sitting in this room today and you have a breath in your lungs, if you have a beat in your heart that God has a purpose for you and he wants to use you, that you are not too far gone, you are not too broken, he can use us in spite of us and he will. And he wants to show you the same things that he showed Elijah because you are a man just like Elijah. And God is the same God. It's not about Elijah. It's not about you. It's not about me. It is about the God that we serve, that he's faithful. A person's days are determined, and you have decreed the number of his months and set limits that he cannot exceed, says Job 14. So if you're not dead yet, because God knows when you're going to die, he's already predetermined that day. He already knows it. So if you're not there yet, maybe you're like Elijah where you're wanting it. I'm here to tell you that you still have meaning and purpose. And God wants to use you. And so if you're in a season of waiting, I want to encourage you that God isn't silent as if he is doing nothing. He's not forsaking you. He's not abandoning you. God loves you and he is with you and he's protecting you and providing for you. And sometimes in ways that you can't even see yet. But open your eyes to see him move. And that will build your faith and that faith will prepare you for what he wants to do through you next. It's often in the waiting that we experience the most growth. It's these times where we have our deepest and richest encounters with God. And they're the sweetest moments that are worth remembering. So church, it's time for us to trust him. It's time for us to see him working in those silent moments where we're living in the brook and we're watching God provide and allow him to prepare us for what he's gonna do next in our life. And so maybe maybe you're new here, maybe, maybe this whole Christian Jesus thing is new for you, but today God spoke to you and you wanna know what it means to have this kind of hope that we're talking about. You wanna see God show up in your life in the way that he showed up in Elijah that you wanna see God provide for you and protect for you because you've realized you can't do it on your own and that you need God to enter your story and to change things. Well, here we believe that, that you're not here by accident. We believe God has brought you in this room for a purpose. And he does indeed want, wants to know you as well. And so we're gonna take a moment and pray. And if that is you and you wanna receive salvation today, if you wanna receive God, I'm gonna ask that you just pray along with me as I pray now, let's pray. God, we thank you for what you're doing in our life. God, thank you for showing up in our moments of waiting. God, when we don't have the answers, when we, God, can wrestle with you, when we are just asking you to show up, God, you are there. And I thank you for your faithfulness and your steadfastness. God, I thank you for your great love for us. Jesus, I want to receive that love today. God, I want to receive you as my Lord and Savior. God, I want to submit my life to you. God, and I want to see you show up in the same way that you showed up in Elijah's life. God, may you show up. May I make you today, God, right here, right now, I make you the Lord and the boss of my life, God. I lay my life at your feet. Do with it whatever you will, Jesus. Thank you. So if you prayed that prayer with me this morning, we're not going to make you do anything weird. But I'm going to ask that you raise your hand in a minute because we want to celebrate that because we just watched another resurrection take place like we did with this young boy. 
And so on the count of three, all I'm going to ask you to do is just raise your hand. If you prayed that with me, on the count of three, raise your hand. We have a gift for you. So one, two, three, go ahead and raise your hand. Anybody in this room, pray for that. Anyone? No. Well, God is doing something incredible here at Grace Point, and we're excited to see what he continues to do. Let me pray for us, and we'll be dismissed. God, we thank you for, God, your mighty work. Jesus, for you to show up in our moments of waiting. God, I pray that we hold on to those moments as we flee the Jezebels in our life. When we come up against things that seem insurmountable, God, things that that seem like we can never overcome. God, when we're burnt out, when we're tired, when we're scared, when we don't know what's going to happen next, God, may we remember your faithfulness. May we remember your goodness and your love. God, thank you for showing up and leading us to the brook where you provide and protect. God, we love you. God, we ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Thanks, church, for worshiping with us today. We'll see you next week. Grace Point.